Good to see you, church. Let's stand together as we begin our time of worship. The great hymn says, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. As we continue in worship in this passage of scripture, I invite you to say this with me this morning. Romans 12, 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Romans 12, 9. Now, before we sing again, we're going to take just a moment, give you the opportunity to speak to those that you've not yet spoken to. And while you're visiting, children, I invite y'all to join me down front. Just come and have a seat right down here. And we're going to give a preview to the sermon here in just a minute. Y'all welcome each other. You can be seated. For three weeks, I've been preaching 
a series of sermons under the general theme of family matters. We talked about marriage on that first Sunday. Last week, we talked about that parent-child dynamic and that fundamental building block of our communities and of our nations that God has put together. But today, I want to talk about leaving a legacy, a legacy. A legacy is what we remember about somebody. And I want to tell you about somebody that was in my life that I remember well. In fact, he was the person who gave me this. Now, you know what this is, right? It's a cane. Who usually uses a cane? Old people. people. Correct. You are, you are correct. Now, you might be surprised to know that my great-grandfather, my daddy's daddy's, my daddy's mother's daddy gave me this when I was your age. I wasn't an old man. I was a child. And he wanted me to have this. It was a cane that he made. It used to be a stick, a limb in a tree. And he, he took it, he cut it, and, and it used to be straight. And he began to slowly but surely bend it so that it would be a walking cane. He made a lot of walking canes for people over the years. And more often than not, he would skin it. He would take the bark off and, uh, and shine it up and make it real pretty. But this was one of his mistakes, and I got his mistake, okay? But I, I am so grateful because it reminds me of how, how creative he was. He was a blacksmith. He was a village marshal. Uh, he had a great garden. I remember all that. So I remember this. This helps me remember who he was, something he gave me. But there's also something else I remember about him, the way he smelled. You know, some people smell funny. Have you noticed that? You will. And some uh, old people, old people smell funny. And the older they get, the funnier they smell. My great-grandfather smelled funny. It was a combination. It wasn't his cologne. It was a combination of smells. One, he smelled like the smokehouse where he smoked bacon and sausage and hams. And he just always smelled kind of smoky, which wasn't a bad smell. It, it kind of made me hungry every time I got around him. But there was mixed with that the smell of sweat. Because he took a bath one day a week, whether he needed to or not, on Saturday before he went to church on Sunday. And so it was always this kind of weird combination of sweat and smoke. Wasn't all that good. But I can close my eyes and smell him to this very minute, okay? Then number three, I remember something that he always did. Every time we'd see him and we were beheaded to his house, he'd say, come on home with me and we'll cut a watermelon. Now, I was your age, and I thought, that's great. It is November, and you can't even hardly find a watermelon in the store, and he's going to cut us a watermelon. We'd get there, and there never was a watermelon. But he promised us one every time. And I, I guess I realized he was a liar sooner or later, and... and <laughs> And I was okay with that because he was, such a, he was such a neat old dude, but I remember him well. Today, I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to talk to your parents. I'm going to talk to your, maybe your grandparents are here. There are some old people here, some young people here. We're all together, and we're going to, we're going to all look at this passage of Scripture and ask God to teach us about leaving a legacy for him. All right? Thank you all for being here, for listening well. Y'all can go back to your seat. Brother Tim's going to lead us as we continue to worship with singing this morning. Let's stand together. It's good to have our children with us this morning as we worship together.
at the end of the psalm, a great Psalm 23, the psalmist writes, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. His goodness follows us. It pursues us. This, this next psalm says, His goodness is running after me. Our God is a good God. And he loves us. Christy's going to lead us as we sing this together. But I want us to be reminded this morning of how good God is. Let's sing together. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. you this morning to join us around this altar as we come to worship to thank him for his goodness his love his mercy 
Will you come? Come and fill our homes with your presence. You alone are worthy of our reverence. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We Father, you know our experience, how much easier it is when we are in church to say the right words, to sing the songs that others around us are singing as well. And, and we want them to be true sometimes, even if they are not. We, we gathered up today and, and it may well be that we are able to come up with a litany of reasons to be grateful. Good things you've done. You are indeed a good, good God. And your goodness is running after us. We could say that, but then we've got some folk in the room who've got some complaints. And if we could open up the heavenly complaint office just for a little while and give us a little piece of paper and a stubby pencil, I'm sure we could come up with some things that are on our list. Some injustices that we've suffered, some inequities that are out there because there are some bad people that are getting way too much goody. And there's some good people who are getting the short end of the stick and we're just not altogether certain why you're handling certain things as you are. So give us a minute, Lord, and a sharp pencil and we're going to come up with a few things. I, oh, I could and have my slights and injustices that I perceived, my reasons to want to sit down with you one day and talk about a few things, but... I'll just be honest with you, Father, and you know this. It, it seems like every time I start making my list and I'm ready to line up in the complaint line, I discover over and over that the problem is not on your side of the desk, it's on my side. Because you're faithful. You haven't changed. You're still that same God and, and you are love. I mean, that's what your word says, and you've proven it to be true again and again and again. And yeah, there's sometimes that I don't understand, and that's okay. You're patient. And even right now, even in this service, you are, you're taking some folk by the hand and saying, come on, listen, pay attention. Let me teach you. Let me help you better understand. You're just that kind of God. And we love you and are grateful for the life that you are pouring out into us through your son, Jesus Christ. And we, we just thank you in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen.
morning we have been blessed by the Generations Choir, our children singing with our adults, and uh, we are so grateful for the good music that we've enjoyed together today. Well, we talked about marriage, we talked about the family, the parent-child relationship, and this morning I want to wind up this three-sermon series by talking about the legacy that we leave. And as I began to prepare getting this message ready, I I realized that there may be a perception, and I want to correct that from the very beginning. This is not just a sermon for old people who are nearing the end of the road and may be concerned about their legacy. Frankly, if you're really old and you feel like you've got one foot in the grave and the other one on a banana peel slipping that way, it's probably too late to be worrying too much about your legacy. It pretty much is already set by that time. No, I, I want to talk to the young folk in the room. I want to talk to young parents. I want to talk to meeting adults. I want to talk to senior adults as well about the legacy that we leave, how we will be remembered. Now, I talked about a, a great grandfather this morning, and, and there was much more to him, I'm sure, much more to him, I'm sure. But those were the things that stuck out in my very immature mind. Those were the impressions that he made on me. And I, I wonder this morning what kind of impression you are making, what kind of imprint you are leaving on your family, what kind of imprint you're leaving on that place where you work, what kind of imprint you're leaving on our community and in our church, the legacy that we leave. Joshua found himself at the the end of his life, not the very end. He wasn't on his deathbed, I don't think, breathing his last breath, but he, he realized that probably his, there were more years behind him than there were ahead of him. He lived to be 110, but somewhere in those waning years, he realized that he needed to, he needed to make a statement. He saw some things as leader. He saw some things that caused him to be a little bit concerned. There was some consternation there, and he wanted to be very clear with that generation about priorities and about the legacy that we leave. This morning, I want to begin reading in verse 14 of Joshua chapter 24. I'll read down through verse 28. It's a lengthy passage, but there's a recurring theme that I want you to hear. Joshua speaking to that gathered congregation, challenged them. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth and Put away the gods which your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. If it's disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is he who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage and who did these great signs in our sight and preserved us through all the way in which we went and among all the peoples through whose midst we passed. The Lord drove out from before us all the peoples, even the Amorites who lived in the land. We also will serve the Lord for he is our God an echo of Joshua's earlier statement of faith, an echo of the challenge that he gave him. We also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. Then Joshua said to the people, you'll not be able to serve the Lord, for he's a holy God. He's a jealous God, and he will not forgive your transgression or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after he's done good to you. Second verse of the song the people said to Joshua, no, but we will serve the Lord. Joshua said to the people, your witnesses against yourselves, that you've chosen for yourselves the Lord to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. Amen, basically. Now, therefore, put away the foreign gods which are in your midst and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua for the third time, we will serve the Lord our God and we will obey his voice. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day, made for them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And he said to all the people, behold, this stone shall be for a witness against us 
for it has heard all the words of the Lord which he spoke to us. Thus it shall be for a witness against you, so that you do not deny your God. Then Joshua dismissed the people, each to his inheritance. Legacy. How we will be remembered. The imprint that we will leave on those closest to us, those whom we have influenced. This is a word to a specific group of people. It wasn't a a, a countywide crusade. It wasn't that they had gone out and put up placards and invited anybody and everybody who wanted to come and hear this message. He was speaking to those who had a particular identity, speaking to those who, who were supposed to be, and this is the moniker they were given, the people of God, those who had had joined him in faith, those who had committed to follow him, those who had said, we believe in the one true God. And it was them, their representatives that were gathered there that day, and it was them that Joshua was speaking to and would have made this statement, which I've made the first part of my text, the first part of the sermon. Our legacy, our imprint, how we will be remembered is rooted in the faithfulness of God. Here's how I came up with that. Joshua is somewhere toward the end. He's not 110 yet, but he's nearing the end of his life. He's looking around and he's, he's, observing, he's observing some things that, that he wants to remind them about. He reminded them of God's faithfulness, of how God had, had called them out. And, and they were, they'd heard the story so many times. You've read the Old Testament story. There was a man named Abra, Abram at the time and And God met him and made him a promise. I want to bless you and make of your family, of your seed, a great nation, so that through your family, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Great promise, a powerful promise made to an old man who had an old wife who at that point in their lives were childless. All right, Lord, we'll go along with you, but we don't see how it's ever going to be possible. Well, God made it possible. He blessed them, gave them a child, gave them a family that grew and And a great nation resulted out of that union and out of that family, just as God had promised. He multiplied them. He watched over them. He brought them to Canaan and gave them cities and homes to live in and crops to sustain them. And all of this was rooted in the faithfulness of God. God promised, God delivered. God promised, God delivered. God promised, God delivered. There was never a time, never a time in their relationship when God said, I will, and then he didn't. There was never a time when when God didn't come through on some of his promises. God's faithfulness was not to be questioned. In fact, we back up a little bit in the chapter to verse 11, and Joshua reminded them of this. You crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho, and the citizens of Jericho fought against you. And the Amorite, and the Perizzite, and the Canaanite, and the Hittite, and the Girgashite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, every ite in the land... Every ite that was out there was ticked off that Israel was in the land and they came up against them and God was with them. Thus I gave them into your hand, Joshua wrote. Then I sent the hornet before you and it drove out the two kings of the Amorites from before you, but not by your sword or your bow. I gave you a land on which you'd not labored and cities which you had not built and you've lived in them. You're eating of vineyards and olive groves, which you didn't plant now. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. Serve the Lord because God has been faithful. Serve the Lord because God has done everything he promised you that he would do. Serve the Lord because God has been with you and God is with you. Serve the Lord because God has a plan that is better than any plan that you could begin to come up with. That was the Old Testament reality that Joshua reminded them of that day. And so here we sit as New Testament believers with a New Testament promise as well. Paul reminded us of it in part in Ephesians chapter 2 beginning in verse 8 when he said, For by grace you've been saved through faith. And oh, by the way, that's not of your doing. It's the gift of God. Not as a result of works. No, no. We don't want anybody to be able to boast about how they accomplish their salvation. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. God has been faithful and God is faithful. God is faithful in our lives. God never breaks a promise to us. I, as I was preparing the message, I got to that part and I, and I just stopped and, and thought for a few minutes. God is so good. I I thought back to 
early days. God is so good. I thought back to experiences in my, in my growing up years and the people that God brought into my life, and I had to say, God is so good. I, I thought back to God's call in my life at the age of 14 and, and how God made a way for me to begin to be able to, to use that call, to exercise that call at 15 and 16 and 17. I, I, I thought about all those things that have happened in my life and how all the way through God has been faithful. God is so good. And some of you are sitting there looking at me and saying, mm-hmm, that's the way it works in preacher world, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'd like to think that it is, but I, I don't live in any different world than, than you live in. You say, well, preacher, my, my life hasn't always been perfect. I've not always had the, the charmed life that you've had. Well, I've got the same kind of scars. I've got the same kind of traumas that you have. And some of you inflicted those on me. I, I've, got, I've got some of the same experiences that you have. And I, I could focus on them. I could. And, and I could become a bitter, an embittered old preacher who's angry at the God for, for the weird and wacky people in the world. And they are out there. But I'm going to tell you what. God's faithfulness overshadows any of the weirdness and wackiness of the world. God sustains us through times that are challenging. God heals us when we are wounded. God provides for us when we are without. God never walks away from his people. And we can reflect on that and and just know that God, God is faithful and will always do what God says that he will do. Oh, the time will come. The day will come when our names will fade from memory. Our possessions will fall into disrepair and be cast aside. Our accomplishments will be forgotten as a new generation takes over. But what will last, what will endure, will be our testimony of trust in the faithfulness of God. And Joshua said, remember, God has been faithful. But number two, as he looked out at them, he realized the times, they are a-changing. There there are a few things that are different here today. and, And you, as he looked at them... You folk have got choices. You've got options. That's the second part of the text. My second point, the options before us are varied and plenteous. As Joshua surveyed the situation, he knew that some in the crowd were playing the field. They wouldn't have put it like that, but that's exactly what they're doing. Because we really are having a love affair with God. We're having a love affair with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. We, we fall in love with Him again each and every day as He pours out His love on us. And when we are tempted to play the field, we are, we're being unfaithful. And that's what Joshua said. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and truth. And put away the gods, little g-gods, which your fathers served beyond the river beyond the Jordan over there, when we were wandering around, waiting to take the land. And and some of the gods that you're worshiping, you've even held on to from our time in Egypt when we were slaves. And now there are those gods of this land, the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. You've got all kinds of choices. And was it that they were dissatisfied with God? Was it that God had failed? No, not in the least. He was a constant and they would never have said, we don't believe in God. We reject God. No, they, they would have announced their fidelity, their faithfulness to God. But when they began to live in that part of the world, they heard about other opportunities. They were an agricultural society and very dependent on the land for their living. Their crops needed to succeed for them to eat for them to be able to have money, to to buy anything else, for them to be able to be a part of the economy. Their their herds needed to increase. Their families needed to increase. And so they heard about the little church down the road in the next community, and they were having a special service, the Blessing of the Crops Sunday. And they were invited to come and be a part of that because it had been a little dry, and the, the uh, the threat of another bad year was on the horizon, perhaps. And so they certainly wanted to have a good year. So they went down to that little neighboring church and sure enough, it was the blessing of the crop Sunday. And they sang a few songs that they'd never sung before and prayed a few prayers that they'd never heard before. And they got a little carried away a time or two in the worship service. And the preacher had some incantations about the crops that they'd never been a part of before. But you know, you got to cover all your bases and they needed a good crop. Not much later, they Heard about another church in the other direction that was having a blessing of the herds Sunday. Even invited you to bring some of your choice heifers to church with you. 
the preacher was going to be laying hands on the heifers and trying to ensure their fruitfulness in the coming year. Well, I mean, if you need milk to drink and meat to eat and, and your, your livelihood depends on the fruitfulness of your herds, and let's go for it. So they go down there for the blessing of the herds and got all these animals that are bleeding and riding, you know, running around during church, worse than some of our kids sometimes. And, and they were trying to keep them under control and they were singing some really interesting songs and the prayers they'd never heard before. And, and some people were getting really happy in whomever the God was and dancing around and carrying on, invoking the name of their God to bless their herd so that they would reproduce and have more animals. And there were other options, other places they could go to worship other gods to ensure the fruitfulness of their families, and on and on it went. It wasn't that they didn't believe in God. It was that they just thought there had to be something more. A little disenchantment, a, a little loss of interest, certainly a loss of intimacy in their relationship with God and they were looking for something more. And that's us. We can identify with that. The yearning for more creates this synthesis of faithfulness to God and at the same time a deep involvement in the world. It desires to have the best of both worlds. Unfortunately, it just doesn't work because to love the world is to drift away from the Lord. But to love the Lord is to realize the satisfaction of our deepest yearnings and desires. Today, we combine our faith, our religion with nationalism, with hedonism, with materialism, with humanism. We've replaced the ites with the isms, and the resulting slum gullion is compromised. It's weak and frankly offensive to God, who, by the way, is still the same God. Our creator, our redeemer, our sustainer, present in our daily lives, not absent, not out of touch, not irrelevant, but very much aware of all that is going on. And he's guiding history toward its consummation. I assure you again that the world and its history is not spinning wildly out of control, headed toward, toward some chaotic crash that nobody has ever anticipated. Our God is still God, sovereign God. And, and things are moving. We may not understand it, and I don't. We may not be able to, to figure it all out and to identify all the players in our end times prophecy, but I assure you, God knows, and he's still guiding us. And you and I here today are a part of what God's up to now. Now. And, and so we, we've got options. And some of you are exercising those options. You've got God and and you're busy. Your lives are full with God and covering all your bases. We want to be sure we, we have a good time. We want to be sure that we have explored all that, that the world has to offer. We want to be sure that, that we've enjoyed the fullness of life and not missed out on anything. God and brings us to the third point, the conclusion, those choices every single day. The choices that we make are collectively creating the legacy that we will at some point leave behind. Joshua had laid out the options. The children of Israel could serve the other gods or serve the one true God. Again, if it's disagreeable, he said, in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether those gods, the ones which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living then a pause, perhaps a, a sweeping glance at some of his, and then this statement. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He had influence, and he recognized that. He had the ability to lead, and he recognized that. And he looked out at that, that group of people that were his friends, and he'd been through so much with them. And he said, you, all of you, as their eyes met, you, you've got to decide which direction you're going to go and, and who you're going to be faithful to and how you're going to invest your life. And the only family I can speak for is, is mine. And as for me and mine, we will serve the Lord. And, and maybe that was a grandiose statement because in reality, he couldn't guarantee his wife or his children or their children's faith. He couldn't really know what they were going to do. He could lead them and he could teach them, which was the best thing that he can do. But at the end of the day, the only one that you can really know about, the only one that you can really have complete control over is you. 
And you can say this morning, if you will, not to me, but to him. I don't know about everybody else, Clint. I don't know about some other people that I hang with. I don't know about some other people that I work with. I, I can't speak for some of my friends, and I don't really know what their priorities are, and they're going to have to make their choices. But as for me, and let's just stop right there, but as for me, I'm going to serve the Lord. As for me, I'm going to serve the Lord. Now remember, after Joshua made that statement three different times, this whole congregation got together. And I don't know if they had the tune that we have. Let's, let's pretend that they did. Three different times, the tune meister stepped up and they all sang together. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And Joshua kind of tamped them down. Now, wait a minute. You do understand what that means. You mean, it means that God wants you to trust him and walk with him and follow him. We got it. Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. One more time now. If you don't, if you say you are and you don't, it's ugly because you find yourself caught up in things that pull you away from God, that tear down your life, that compromise your witness. We got it, Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then he did a weird thing. We don't get it, but it was more of a cultural thing. He took a rock. He had him a, a stone out there, and he sets up this rock right there in the middle of him. He said, okay, folks, the stone heard your words. This stone is our witness. Whatever. I mean, whatever he could use down the road to say, hey, the rock is still there. It heard everything you said. We got it. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Hmm. Choices. The choices that we make are creating our legacy. Choices about our priorities, those things that we will include, bringing in to our homes, bringing into our minds, bringing into our lives, but also those things that we choose to exclude that we keep out, our choices about relationships, whether we will intermingle our lives with the world's offerings or whether we will keep ourselves to the Lord. It doesn't mean that we're going to be necessarily weird oddities. It means simply that we're going to choose. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Our choices about our investments. I'm not talking about your investment accounts that are going to get you through your old age years. I'm talking about the things that we pour ourselves into. Are they those things that scratch your itches? Are they those things that give you what you want? Are, are they those things that allow God to do what God wants to do in your life? The wizened, aging, old leader says, you got so many choices, so many directions you can go. Even today, so many alliances that you can create and allegiances that you can give yourself to. All I can say is that as for me and mine, we're going to serve the Lord. We choose. Heavenly Father, we are, we are a part of our culture. We are one little piece of our world. And you've put us here, and you have been faithful. You have blessed us, God, again and again and again. You found us when we were lost and saved us, and you gave us a new name. We are your children. We're called Christian. And, Father, you've been there all the way through, and, and you will be there all the way through and Father, we, we live in a world that needs to know who you are, and, and we want to be a good witness, a clear witness, a faithful witness. And I pray that we, like Joshua, could stand collectively and individually and say with confidence, as for me and mine, Father, we're going to serve you. I pray that nothing will get in the way, nothing will rob us of that opportunity, but that we will be faithful as you have been faithful to us. In Christ we pray. Amen.